Now it's time to give the word to the leader of EATS Scientific Core, chairman of EATS Advisory Board. Please give a big hand to Professor Johan Rockström from Stockholm Resilience Center. Dear friends, you are certainly much more than an audience. From a scientific perspective, you're clearly brothers and sisters in arms for the next two days to address not the grand challenge, but probably the grandest challenge humanity is facing of securing a prosperous and resilient future for mankind on our humble little planet. That this is the grandest challenge of all is increasingly being understood. We see a tremendous nervousness in the world with regard to the shock waves, with regard to the challenges, with regard to the opportunities in the area of food, health, and sustainability. It comes clearly from the evidence that, in fact, the Balance Act is tremendous. Just think of it. Another 2 billion people in 36 years of 9 billion people on Earth, all having the right to development of equity and fair sharing of the ecological space, which is dwindling in the world of an agricultural system which is delivering food, but in an unsustainable way, and being the number one culprit of the negative and larger and growing environmental risks we're facing. Just look on climate, the fact that we need to transform into a sustainable agricultural future, increasing food production with another 50% just over the next generation. And on this collides the health shocks that we now have started to get so familiar with. I think the World Health Organization's information that we now have evidence of potentially a post-antibiotic era when uh, meticillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is increasingly being a factor that could affect generations to come. This is a health food sustainability issue because the larger sources of these threats originate from wildlife and livestock in our modern agricultural systems. We have evidence, in fact, that we are in a completely new juncture. We've learned to understand these environmental hockey sticks of carbon dioxide increase, increased and escalated loss of biodiversity to the point that we're now in the sixth mass extinction of species. But this interacts intimately with the challenge of obesity in the upper left-hand corner, stunting, the resistance to antibiotic, number of growing of infectious diseases, and that these interlinkages all have one core interconnection point, namely our modern food system. This has led science to conclude that we've entered a whole new geological era, which has been baptized at the Anthropocene. And it all originates from the globalization of a world economy that in the last 50 years has gone through a great acceleration. Illustrated here by the global internet connections, the global transport systems that operate today at the global scale, energy fluxes, and finally, just look at the Facebook connections in the 21st century's young age. Even policies understanding that yes, we are at a new juncture. The economist welcomed humanity to the Anthropocene a few years back. The Anthropocene being the notion that we are now, as humanity, 7 billion people multiplied by the industrial metabolism, a global force of change that surpasses the natural changes that have taken the planet in and out of its stability domains in the millions of years, billions of years of Earth's existence. This is, in truth, a new juncture for humanity, the grandest of all challenges. Now, are we seeing evidence that this is kind of creating shockwaves and social and economic costs today? Well, I would argue that science shows yes. We have evidence that the unexpected release of methane in Siberia with thawing permafrost could cost the world economy 60 billion US dollars, which in turn could influence both food and social welfare. We have growing evidence that the Arab Spring would probably not have gone to scale if it hadn't been for the simultaneous shock in terms of rising phosphorus prices, rising oil prices, which is the engine of modern cultural practices, and President Putin and Prime Minister Rudd shutting down export borders of cereals because of 10 years of consecutive droughts and forest fires, creating probably the first ever regional scale social ecological shock to the food system, even propelling social instability. We see evidence that even when Hurricane Sandy, two years back, veered right into Manhattan, putting a bit symbolically, perhaps, even Wall Street three meters underwater, showing that the financial system also has its sustainability challenges, that it's difficult to explain this without factoring in the collapse of the Arctic vortex that holds cold, high-pressure air in the Arctic. Interconnections that are new and occurring at one degree Celsius warnings. 
So we are, in fact, facing a situation of super wicked problems. This is the World Economic Forum's famous global risk analysis of interconnections in the global space of welfare and economics. Look at the EAT agenda here. How food, environment, sustainability, health, obesity, equity, which is the basis for everything that matters for our economic growth, for our well-being, are fundamentally part of the risk landscape of today. Just look at the accumulation of data of deaths over the 20th century. 5.7 billion people have perished over the past century. But look at the big, big killers in the world. Non-communicable diseases, cancer is part of them, and infectious diseases. When you look behind these, they're all more or less connected to our lifestyles, to malnourishment, to equity issues, poverty, and growing interactions between zoonotic diseases and human infections. Now, a few examples on this line of action that we'll be discussing. Climate change is one of them, of course. You've all seen the IPCC fifth assessment that came out a few months back, showing the scenarios for the end of the century with the dramatic reality that we're following the red line towards a four degree average warming. This is a place we haven't been for the past four million years. The effects in terms of health are increasingly well documented. Rise of infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases climbing into new latitudes, crop pests and diseases and potential collapse of food systems, heat waves, droughts affecting both health directly and through food, food insecurity, risks that we now need to immediately address and transform food systems into a sustainable trajectory. We know that this is occurring already today without even factoring in climate change. This is work from Matthias Klum in Borneo, where we know that 75% of rainforest has been cut down for palm oil. This affects the frequency of forest fires, which in turn affects the Southeast Asian monsoon, destabilizing food systems across the world. And the data is clear. We're losing forests, increasing palm oil in food systems very rapidly. Shrimp farming, a large-scale system by small-scale farmers trying to survive, but being propelled out into unsustainable practices, losing resilience to shocks because of loss of mangrove. And again, the data is very decisive. So we are operating a system, a food system, in unsustainable sink. And this is particularly worrying because we're learning so much of the importance of ecosystems. We learn from work here from UNEP summarizing science that in the left-hand corner that monocultures of food production do deliver very well on crops and meat, but they lose out on all the other ecological functions, such as carbon sequestration. 25% of our emission carb of carbon dioxide is sequestered in soils in natural ecosystems. Nature itself, in the upper right-hand corner, does not deliver either immediate human needs. They deliver very well on pollination, sequestration. But the challenge, of course, is sustainable systems in the right-hand corner that can fulfill the whole palette of ecosystem services and resilience for humanity. Therefore, we have signaled to the United Nations that a new agenda for development in the world must be to recognize that a stable climate system, biodiverse ecosystem services, builds resilience which can deliver on the food systems and all the social aspirations. This agenda is not integrated. We're still living in isolated silos in policy, business and science, not addressing this fundamental interaction. So clearly we have emerging challenges. Just look at this example of unsustainable fisheries of small-scale farmers being collapsed, not least from industrial fishing fleets, even from the European Union. Farmers having to leave their rural areas because of droughts and floods which leads to more people dwelling into rainforests and living increasingly and depending on bushmeat, which in turn increases exposure to wildlife-induced pathogens and zoonotic diseases that increases risks of shock waves because of these new social dynamics. We're now interconnected in this way to the global scale because climate change is a driver. Now, to round this off, it all boils down to the ethical challenge of feeding humanity and providing healthy and happy lives for 9 billion people in 36 years. Now, science shows that this can be done. In fact, we can produce food enough for 9 billion people. The challenge is how to do it. We know that we've come to the end of expansion of agriculture. We know we've come to a point where we really need to invest in sustainable practices on current crop plant, and we need to shift diets and lifestyles and particularly address the enormous equity challenge in the world. Just look at a map of phosphorus use and nitrogen use, you'll see immediately that a few rich overuse and the vast majority are poor underutilized. 
But the big challenge, of course, is this, and this is the EAT agenda. How can we do this? How can we transform food systems that improve human health, are resilient and fair, and safeguards Earth sustainability? And that, dear friends, is why we're here over the next two days. And I just want to emphasize that it was a real strike of luck from above when a medical doctor, but also so deeply engaged in the private sector, when Gunil called me and said, let's join forces around this. And I was actually shocked to see then what enormous engagement from top scientists around the world to engage around this interact, integrated agenda on health, sustainability, and food. Not only for the, for the diagnostics, not only to understand better the risks, but really to explore solutions. Because now we're beyond the time of incremental change, we're truly in the time of transformative change. In fact, we just have five, 10 years to start transforming the global food system if we want to avoid high probability, really high risk outcomes for coming generations. The fantastic uniqueness of EAT is not only the integration of disciplines that happen to often live in isolation, health, food, sustainability, and exploring these interactions in a very profound way. It is also doing it in co-design and co-production, having business, policy, and science joining forces in addressing the knowledge gaps, in addressing the questions, in addressing the solutions. That's why we look forward to pull up our, our arm sleeves and work together. This is not a forum of hand-waving. This is a forum of formulating a solutions and action agenda for the coming years. We're so excited at building this bridge between knowledge and action on this agenda. Why? Because it has so tremendous untapped potentials. The Science Advisory Board of EAT consists of a phenomenal group of people, and we've gathered around one working hypothesis, that in fact there are synergies which are enormously untapped, that healthy and sustainable food systems are a prerequisite and can be successfully implemented for human prosperity on a stable planet, and that this combined agenda is really the key for action. It's with enormous pride I just put this slide on to say that, you know, the call that was put out was responded by top, top actors in business, policy, and science. And most of the EAT advisory board is here today and tomorrow. And I'd just like to kind of, on behalf of the entire advisory board, say that this has been an enormous journey so far, and we're just at the beginning. And we all thank you for joining us here this time. Now, the partnership of EAT is wide, as you may be aware. We have a group of funding partners, but also academic partners, research and development partners, publishing partners. So the key idea here is to be innovative also in the new ways of generating knowledge. So all novel ideas should be put on the table during the next two days to be able to really go to scale with solutions and knowledge ideas. I'd like to close with this quote of my dear colleague and friend, Carl Folke at the Stockholm Resilience Center, which I think, after all, is the kind of foundation why this is so tremendously important. That nature in the biosphere is not simply a question of values, something you appreciate or not. It is the prerequisite for all life on this planet. And it forms the foundation, and I think we can find enormous opportunities of advancing this together over the next two days. Thank you very much.